Good afternoon and welcome to our new knowledge session. My name is Sandy Ratliff. I'm with Virginia Community Capital and I'm one of the partners in this um, professional development series. Um, I'm happy to partner with the uh, Washington County uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Virginia Highland Small Business Incubator and the town of Abington. It's hard to believe that we've been doing this for over 10 years. But we have lots of content out there that if you ever need any um, guidance on anything, it's you just go to our YouTube channel and you will find it. Uh, today's session is being recorded for training and education purposes. Um, and we have everyone muted. But if you have a question, because this is for your benefit, uh, please post those in the Q&A or the chat feature and we will address those. Uh, during the session and especially afterwards. Um, uh, also, today's session will be uploaded on the Virginia Highland Small Business Incubator's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel, New Knowledge, where you'll find over 200 other um, sessions that we've done over the past um, almost, I guess, since we've been recording over eight years. Today, uh, my co-host is uh, Nita Farmer with the Washington County Chamber of Commerce. She's going to introduce our speaker and serve as moderator. So, Nita, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Sandy. Welcome to everyone. Um, we're certainly glad to have all of you today. Uh, I would like to introduce Rex Carter. He's HR Generalist for Universal Fibers. He's got some other titles, too, and I'll let him tell you a little bit about him. <laughs> so. All right. Well, thanks, Nita. Thank you, Sandy, for uh, your all's work, the great work that you all do in getting this information out. And it's certainly an honor to, to be here with you today while everybody's grabbing lunch. And so I just want to share some information with you. And we did a, this presentation very similar, I think, maybe a couple of years ago, then COVID came along. And we all know how that, that turned out for our businesses and some challenges that we face. But now we're in a little different challenge. And so it's something I want to share with you today. So I do serve as human resources generalist here at Universal Fibers, also handle uh, security operations, as well as uh, our corporate citizenship program. I do a lot of stuff internally with uh, with associates, whether it's from you know, internal policy procedure, onboarding, recruiting, uh, along those lines. So, And if you do have questions or comments, uh, because I know we were uh, getting the, the monitor set up earlier with, uh, and so Nita and Sandy, so if you guys see a question or comment come in, just holler at me, let me know, because all I see is what we've got on the screen. So we'll make the best of it. Hope everyone is enjoying this beautiful day. Uh, who's glad to see 70 degree temperatures? Yay. First day of March. And so um, we're excited that springtime is here. So, uh, all right, well, let's get started. And again, some of the stuff may be familiar information. And really what I want to do is just uh, let you guys know kind of what what I've done, what we as a, as a company, Universal Fibers, has done just on a, on a general level, because we have seen some, some huge challenges in the labor market. Uh, I know prior to COVID, we were running very well. We didn't have a lot of turnover. COVID came along. Um, you know, we were very fortunate because of our leadership, done a great job in really keeping the doors open the best we could. And I know a lot of businesses did that. Unfortunately, there were some businesses that could not sustained through a very challenging time. And so uh, I mean, we hit some bumps in the road as well. But when we see the last 18 months or so of the COVID time and we come back out on the other side, some things that we saw uh, we're still dealing with, it's impacting our labor force. We've had everything from the unemployment challenges uh, all the way through. So we'll, we're gonna look at that in a little bit, but uh, just, to, just to get going with you, I wanna share with you this quote. <laughs> General George Patton, I don't know how much history reading you do for military leaders or anything like that, but uh, he had this saying that to hold the enemy by the nose and kick him in the pants. Now, I know it's lunchtime, let's be nice here, but really what, what General Patton was getting at, when you go back and read, I, I enjoy reading a lot of, of, of history on military leaders, and in a book called Patton on Leadership, how, how he deals with business and, and what General Patton put in play for military strategy for business is really this concept that employers must be aggressive in, in all efforts to find quality candidates. But more than finding the quality candidates, we've got to maintain the labor required for the function of the job and, of course, profitability. I don't know about you, but I think every business listed on here, we're in the business to, to make money, to make profit, right? And, and Patton knew that his aggressive tactic in World War II 
when faced with a problem, faced with the enemy. So employers today, we can see the enemy as perhaps you know unemployment, pandemic, uh, uh, the rising cost, inflation, all of this stuff. So, so maybe we can take that aggressive approach in in looking at this rather than uh, sitting back saying, "Well, the labor will come to us." Now we're in a little different day. We've got to find the labor. Uh, so, what are some what's in your system? And I, I look at it this way that that we all have a system. I, I think. And uh, if we don't, maybe we need to develop one as employers. Well, we know that recruitment and retention, these are key components, and we've got to integrate that within our company system. So maybe you have a, a good system that works uh, with different processes and compensation, you know, what's your benefits, your training, uh, what's your safety program, what are your HR policies, your procedures? Uh, do you have good supervision and working conditions? So all of these things put together create a system for success especially when you have the right applications uh, and, and the right applicants that are recruited and retained and retained being the key thing, because we have seen a, a high number of turnover, uh, both here at Universal and, and a lot of my counterparts that I talked to. And, and some of you, some of you have well, as well, if we've met before or talked. And so what we're finding is that, you know, one of the big challenges we'll look at the next slide in just a moment, that's going to really address a lot of these things. We'll probably spend most, most of the time on but it really gets down to, to are we thinking outside of the box in recruiting uh, good qualified labor? And we're going to look at that in just a moment. So something I want you to keep in mind as we go through this. So what are the rising challenges? And are there more we can add to this list? So maybe you uh, you can send in your comments and, and we'll look at those. So there was a study done, Implicity.com did a study in 2018 that's very reflective of today's market, even, even we're calling it post-pandemic. And we know that the, that the, the HR landscape, the, the landscape of the business uh, really must continually um, evolve, really, to keep up with, with modern-day trends and challenges and, and a lot of the changing employment laws and regulations that we all face. And so we know that uh, some companies will have human resource consultants, and we know that others will go to outside staffing agencies and all that. But here's a list of things I want to go with, go over with you. We know one of our big challenges that we faced were the unemployment benefits. People got paid to stay home. And, and we know this, whatever your thoughts are on, on, on government intervention on that. You know, and we've, we had a very difficult time because people were like, hey, I can make more money stay at home doing nothing than I can to get up at five o'clock in the morning and work a 12-hour shift. And so, so that was a challenge that, that we faced a lot. So, so we really had to go back and readdress some things as far as you know, starting compensation. And I'm sure you all have as well. You know, we've had people come in and say, well, look, I can go down the road and make more money. Uh, I'm like, okay, but what kind of, of benefits are they offering you? Uh, we have found that there's a younger generation today that, and again, just my thought, not reflective of universal fibers, but just my thought, it seems like that we have a younger generation that they they're looking at what can you put in my pocket? And they're not worried about 401k. They're not, they're not worried about uh, medical, dental vision. Not worrying about, they just want to know, give me my money now that I want to get. And then, then they seem to be okay. But is that really the solution? So we see that there's uh, unemployment benefits was a challenge. Here's one thing that we have, we've really worked hard to address that we have now partnered with United Way, and that's child care coverage. Uh, we now under a grant and for a two-year pilot project, we have Universal Fibers, we've partnered with United Way uh, to pay a portion of child care cost for our associates. So, for example, I had a young man who come in this morning and he uh, brought in his, his paper where his children are in daycare. And so, so we're going to cover a portion of that cost uh, through this grant with United Way. They're going to cover a portion and then they'll cover the remaining, um, basically the remaining third of that, so to speak. And that's been a really huge benefit for us in retaining employees and helping ease the burden. Because here's the thing, if gas is, and it's up and down, I think Sam's was like 285 the other day for, for gas. And it's been as what, 385 for it. So we've seen uh, a, a wide range in gas prices. Well, inflation, six, eight, nine percent. The cost of groceries has gone up 20, 30 percent. But guess what? Most of our companies, most of the income that our associates and employees are making, that really hasn't changed to meet the demand of inflation. So when you have somebody whose child care costs are the same or even more because child care, 
they they've got a their business they've got to make money too well if they're increasing their fee as well then um you know here's the problem is that what they have coming in is a little less than what's going out so if we can help offset that cost we're looking at that as a as a retention tool uh, that we've partnered with United Way, and right now it's it's a success, and so we're hoping that uh, that that continues. Now, the other the third point here we see is remote work issues. I don't know about you guys. Does anybody have problems with, hey, can I work at home <laughs> today or for the next six months? You know, I can get out of bed, bounce to the living room, and I'm at work. So now I save money on gas. I don't have to uh, close for work, and life is good, and and so on. So we we really bounce back and forth with this. We did have. Uh, some of our uh, administration work from home at times. There were those of us who had to come in. We had to be here regardless during the pandemic, but but we still see this as a challenge today. Uh, and and really, as we're coming out of pandemic and we're moving into the future, uh, we still see that across the board, a lot of industries are, are now looking at this. Is this cost savings or is it not? Some jobs, you have to be there. We know that. And that's a challenge for employers today of, okay, we've got uh, we got people that can work remote. Is it cost savings or is it better to have, you know, people in the seats, in the offices, uh, that face-to-face type, um, face-to-face type work? So uh, I see that as as a challenge that's still out there. I don't think that's being completely resolved just yet. I know a lot of employers gave you know, mandates, hey, look, we need you back in the office, come back to work. So uh, another issue is compensation. I know you all have seen as well as I have the uh, minimum wage going up. We've seen, I think, really across the board in Southwest Virginia. Uh, I have to go back and check my numbers, but I think uh, we've seen, don't actually quote me, I know you're recording this, but I think it's around 18% or so increase uh, in starting wages across the board for a lot of manufacturing companies. You know, we've had to we've had to meet that demand just like you all have. And so uh, it, it's, it's unfortunate it's the name of the game. We can't go back and pay uh, an employee money we were paying them two or three or four years ago and expect that amount of, of labor force to show up. Uh, they're right now, if, if I can go work at, you know, uh, at, at a fast food restaurant and, you know, make a couple of dollars more than what I may make here. Well, again, we go back to that generational thought of, Hey, I, you know, what money can you put in my pocket without the forethought of retirement or, uh, other medical benefits and that sort of thing. So, so compensation, I think, is a challenge for all of us. And it's really, you know, because we know if we increase compensation, unless we raise prices on our products to offset that, so we see a, a good bottom line at the end of the year, that's a challenge. I put this in here, transportation and housing. Now, I want to speak to this just for a moment. And I don't know, um, uh, I know that, that Nita, Sandy, I can see we've got several participants on, and I know that I had an idea of a list of who all was on here, but uh, I'd be interested in seeing or, or putting this out there. How many companies do we have, maybe on here or others, you know, that are classified as second chance employers that if you have uh, a person who comes to you and they say, well, look, I, I've done some jail time. I had a, maybe a drug charge or uh, something, you know, trespass or whatever. So they've got something on a criminal history. Now, depending upon that position, obviously, you know, you have to vet your your uh, new hires very thoroughly. But uh, one of the things that, that I've seen, we have reached out. In fact, we were, I mean, we were thinking way outside the box during the last couple of years where we really needed labor. We went, um, we've done everything from, from high school, co-op programs, probation, parole, uh, career fairs, VEC. We've done all of these things just to try to meet the labor demand. And what we found the biggest challenge for for these particular people that they're they're getting out of out of incarceration, they've done their time. We vet them thoroughly. We I sit down and personally I do the interview with them because of my background from law enforcement, and so I know a little bit more about what questions to ask. And here's the thing I found: we have people that would love to work. They want that second chance at life, and they would love to have a have a a job, a good steady paycheck because they're trying to get things turned around their life, but they they don't either have a license or a car because they've been incarcerated. So how are they going to get to work? And then we've had some who, who, and I know this is a bigger, bigger piece of the puzzle here, but housing, I've had several who say, well, look, I, I just got out. I'm at a halfway house and then I've got to find other housing. 
does anybody realize one of the biggest issues we have in Southwest Virginia is housing? And, and we see that rent has, I don't know, is anybody paying cheap rent? I don't think anybody is. And if you're not, you know, if you're paying rent, you, you're paying some good money uh, for, uh, for that little two, three bedroom or whatever it may be. But yet we have people who are coming out and they, they would love to have a job. Some of the best associates that I have hired have been people who did, thankfully, have transportation someplace to stay, but they wanted to get their life turned around. And I'm telling you, they work circles around people because they appreciate somebody taking a chance on them. But it's still a challenge. Now, I, we've even, I, I mean, I've even, I, I'll be honest with you, I've even pitched the idea of, can I run a bus? You know, I'll go down here to Greyhounds and run, rent a bus and bring people in if we have to. But again, you know, logistics and money and all that. So I don't know, folks, maybe this is something that you all don't face, but I think it's just another challenge in today's labor market that we see. What about this one? Uh, is anybody having any um, any mass exits, retirements, accelerated exit of baby boomers? Everybody's hitting you know that that age of all right. We're moving on doing other things. Uh, we have seen that some here, but not as much as other companies that I've talked with. So perhaps that may be a challenge. How do you replace thirty years experience? How do you replace forty years experience? Somebody who is really well grounded in your organization. Uh, so one of the things that that I know several companies have been doing is, okay, we have a we have a, um, a thirty year employee. They're very knowledgeable. They're key to the operation. Uh, we don't want to lose that talent, that skill set. So we'll say, okay, look, you retire. Would you be interested in coming back working kind of like, like a 1099 contract a couple of days a week, you know, just to maintain that access to a valuable resource of information? So we've done that a little bit. I know other companies have, and that is really a good way to keep people involved unless there's that person that says, look, I've given my time. I'm sitting on a small island somewhere in the South Pacific. Don't call me. I won't call you. I don't know. Maybe you you have that type of person, but but we have found that to be a success in a little bit of a challenging market where where we still need that experience because we're starting to see the gap of of, of the more experienced generation retiring, younger generation coming in, and so we we've got to merge the two. Um, one thing that I see from an HR perspective in hiring, retaining, and, and uh, recruiting people, they'll come and say, hey, uh, $15 an hour, $16 an hour. Uh, okay, I'm going to go down here for $17. Come back to me. Can I get $18? And so that's the kind of market it is. So wherever you set your standard entry rate, um, you know, one of the things that we really push is, okay, here's what money we can offer you, but I want you to look at the bigger picture. You know, I did recruiting in personnel division um, for uh, for the state when I was in law enforcement several years ago. And to me, one of the challenges, and we even still see it today, was to get people to look at the big picture. Uh, money in your pocket is important. And that's what I tell folks. Look, yes, you want to know, what are you going to be able to buy gas and groceries with? But on the flip side, what are you doing to take care of your family in the future? And what are you doing to, to set up a good financial future for yourself through your retirement 401k? Uh, so, so we see that sometimes the, the counter offers. What about this training of new hires? Now, why is this a challenge? Um, because some companies are facing a three to one ratio for every three you hire, two leave, you maybe get one. It could be higher, five to one, six to one. It really depends. But uh, by the time that we invest in a new hire and we put them through, depends on which department they go to here, it could be anywhere from a four to eight week training. Well, they come in, they get trained, they get a few paychecks in the pocket. Next thing you know, they may be gone. So uh, we're going to speak to that in just a moment about how can we how can we recruit and retain a little bit better. But do you all find that there are challenges in training new hires? To an extent, uh, I think that there there is because I see a younger generation, they love these little things. If you can see, they love these little things. Um, this is, this is not a, a phone anymore. It used to be come in a bag about this big. It had a cord and you thought you were, you were big time because you had a big bag phone in your, uh, am I, am I sounding too old? Does anybody remember that? Am I making, okay, just somebody help me out here. But, but now phones have gotten sleek and slim. You know, I, I can do everything on this phone that I can do on a computer. I mean, I don't know how to, but I think they tell me that I can, I can book a flight. I can order meals. I can get groceries. 
I can watch movies. I can do all of this stuff. The world has gotten this small. And if I want to, then I can make a phone call. Sure. But we are finding that this is a challenge for younger generation. Now, there's some of us that are not as young. I'm not saying old, maybe older. Come on, somebody help me. But what I'm finding is that is that we find that people live their lives in this little box. So what we find now is uh, soft skills. Uh, we had a meeting the other day with a local school system that they are now implementing classes to teach soft skills because we have seen almost a complete disappearance of how anybody can come in and sit down and look you in the face for an interview. Uh, how do they write the, on their application? You know, when their application looks more like a, a text message and emoji, I'm thinking we, you know, we've got a problem. Uh, so, so we're really challenging uh, our, our associates here. Look, don't walk and talk. Don't walk and text on the phone. It's a safety violation. And so we really are trying to push that. So maybe you guys see that issue as well. Don't know. Um, here's another challenge that, that we have seen over the last uh, couple of years. Applicants that need more flexibility. Uh, we are in, and I don't know what generation it is, X, Y, Z, something. Maybe somebody can help me out wherever we are. But what we're finding now is that we have a generation who they feel like if they come in, and we have 12 hour shifts here at Universal. Well, I get all my work done in eight. Can I now go home? Uh, that's not the way it works. Uh, maybe some jobs may let you do that, but here you clock in, we need you for 12. Uh, and but really there's enough work for for all 12 hours. But but I have faced that. And and we see that people are needing more flexibility. Uh, or they they desire that. And it's a generation that says, hey, I show up, I get my work done. Why do I need to stay around? I've got other things I want to go do. So, yeah, that that's a little bit of a challenge to to overcome that cultural mindset or that that um, generational mindset rather. Um, adapting to multi generational workforce. You know what we find, and one of the interview questions I ask applicants often is, "How do you feel you can work with more experienced uh, employees? How do you think you will mesh with people who have been here for a while?" And I'll get younger applicants who will say, well, I've never thought about that. I said, well, can you take instruction and constructive criticism from somebody who's got more experience? And for the most part, yeah, they're good. I've had some who they will answer as in, well, I don't need anybody tell me what to do. You show me the job and I'll do it. Those kind of applicants don't last very long. So, so when we look at a, a multi-generational workforce, we as companies have to adapt to that because, again, we have a generation that lives on these cell phones, and then we have a generation here who who knows nothing of a cell phone. They don't even want, don't even, believe it or not, we've got some that don't even have a cell phone. Now, I don't know. Maybe I'm not that old. Maybe I'm not that young, but I'm like, all right, I've, I kind of rely on my cell phone a lot. So um, we've got, but that's just that that generational mindset that these folks come to work. They work and they go home and that's their life. Uh, so, so how are we as companies adapting to that? Uh, so maybe we'll look at that in a little bit more in just a minute. And we'll be mindful uh, as we get into this of our time as well. Um, do you all see this as a challenge as well? And I put this in one need for fully integrated digital services. <laughs> Where are the candidates? Where are they connected? Uh, do you all have uh, as part of your system, how do you connect and communicate with your associates? Do you have you know, internal digital services? Uh, does everybody have email or is there mass text messaging or whatever? Because getting the word out to people, we are now in a day where if I get on my computer and I type in, I go to Google and I type in a search for, I don't know, uh, blue kayaks, for example. Now that I said that my phone's listening. So guess what I'm getting ads for here in about an hour. So um, and I probably said, so if y'all's phones are needed, y'all going to get ads for blue kayaks. So uh, I, I ruined your day there. But um, but really, how are we connecting with our uh, applicants and candidates and all that? One of the things that we've done, we've got the ADP system here. So we can set up to where we can electronically connect. We can get all the forms to them. We can do all of that rather than just paper. So we cut down on paper usage a little bit that way. Uh, by using some digital services that we have. So, uh, all right, so let's jump in. So those are just a few things. Maybe you guys have more challenges. These are just some that I put in there that I thought maybe 
kind of what you guys are looking at as well. And this is not an inclusive list, so maybe there's a lot more out there, but uh, let's see. So, so when we recruit people, and again, we're looking at labor challenges. So is it a challenge for you to advertise in the newspaper? Well, financially, have you all, has anybody checked out how expensive it is for the newspaper? Well, you know, it is a little older approach. Uh, readership is declining. More newspapers are going to digital. And um, you know, I get a daily digital um, paper from the Bristol Herald Courier. It's quick. It's easy. I open up email. I can click through. I can read headlines. I scan it. I'm done in three, four minutes. I just want to stay up to date and see if there's anything of interest that I need to jump in on. If not, boom, I'm done. And I've not touched the first piece of paper. So, uh, you know, helps for environment and all that. But newspaper digital ads are getting uh, are getting pretty pricey. But do you guys advertise on social media? Now, one of the things that we did for our labor challenge was uh, we did a very extensive, and this was about uh, last year, June, July, August, somewhere there. We had orders, I mean, blowing through the place. We had a, a ton of our business was great. Uh, third, fourth quarter began to soften on the worldwide market, but yet we still did very well. But one of the things we did is, is we did a three-month uh, mass media campaign of TV, um, uh, email, social media, Facebook, um, I think there's something else. I don't remember. It was pretty massive, but this is where a lot of people are living on social media. I don't know how many of you don't have to raise your hands or anything like that, but I'm guessing that perhaps you all, maybe this morning you got up, you got your coffee on, you got it in. And what's the first thing you did? You got to check Facebook. What's the latest on scanner food or who got chased, who got locked up, who's eating a wonderful meal, who's sitting on the beach, uh, who's the latest breakup, romance, whatever. We all probably did that and, uh, and, and jumped in there. So let's see. Oh, I found out. Hey, um, Sandy, I found I can open up chat on here. I did not realize that. So cool. Um, I'm just scanning real quick, real quick. It's like squirrel. Anyway. Uh, okay, good deal. So I found something. Anyway, get back on that. So Sandy, I did find a chat option on here. I just saw it. So you're probably seeing the same name. So Cool. All yeah, right. So, if anybody's got questions, please, uh, please let Rex know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that now. So awesome. Okay. Um, let's see. Erica, community resource now here for Bristol. All right. Awesome, Erica. Yay. Okay, cool. So back to social media. So uh, from political ads, used cars. Look, folks, I don't know how the algorithm stuff works, but I will tell you one thing that if I type in, uh, you know, Nita's shopping for a blue kayak. I don't know why I'm on that today, but there we go she types it in or I type whatever, guess what you're going to see? Facebook ads, all of this stuff is going to start popping it up. There's all these algorithms, all this technological stuff. Well, look, if you're advertising because your biggest challenge is labor, then go to where the people are. And, and one thing about Facebook I know from experience is I can go in and I can specifically lay out zip codes and I can upload lists and I can yeah, I can I can target a certain area. So instead of me advertising on Facebook from here to California, if I just want Southwest Virginia, I can target. So it's very, very handy on that. Uh, LinkedIn, we use LinkedIn. Uh, some we use Indeed quite a bit. Uh, ZipRecruiter, we've had a little success with that. Um, but then there are others that can help extend your reach. Now, one of the things that we find that in the challenges of, of the labor that helps us more than anything is uh, referrals and we incentivize our referrals. So if you refer somebody and they get hired, you, you, you got money uh, right then. And then also you've got, uh, more money coming. If they're here six months, good attendance. I think a lot of agencies, a lot of companies are doing this now bonuses and, and all of that. So, uh, sign on bonuses, the, the pay to stay deal, and that's really becoming the norm. So, so one of the challenges that I've, I've seen a lot of companies do as well as, as us is that, Hey, you know, if you're going to keep good people, you've got to do something to keep them on uh, on the hook here. And because we all need good, uh, good quality applicants, uh, employment or temp staffing agencies. Um, those are good resources, too, that we've used everything from we've got several local staffing agencies that I'll call, uh, including VEC as well. So we've got several of them that uh, that we can reach out to. So if we find ourselves if we, we're facing with a challenge of we need. 10 people in the next two weeks or whatever, we're going to reach out to those people and uh, reach out to those services. And so something to really think about, you know, what is the challenge 
and what is the out of the box approach that we can do to recruit people to help us out? Um, let's see. Does that change yet? No. Okay. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, this is if you're getting into the, the specific logistics and some dynamics. What's your most important recruiting KPIs that you can track to measure? Your KPIs, your key performance indicator. So how many qualified candidates per job post? What's your time to hire? The acceptance rate? What's the source of hires at a job post and social media and the cost per hire internal rate? So for those who may have a little bit more business aspect uh, of your job, this is pretty good on, on how you are uh, tracking your recruitment. Are you getting the most bang for your buck? Uh, if you are spending uh, a high amount of money and you're only getting two or three candidates, and this is not a maybe a high salary managerial position, this is you're in the door hourly labor type um, positions, uh, then you may want to look at this. How long does it take you to hire somebody? Uh, you know, how many do you, if you bring in five interviews, do three accept, do two accept, where do they learn from the job or where do they learn of the job? And then, so how much does it cost you per hire and turnover? So most companies have that figured out. Uh, if it costs you 10,000 to train and you keep that person for so long, what's your return, your investment uh, on that? So, so that's just, I put that in there just for a little thought. Um, uh, how do you reset? How do you uh, uh, set a recruitment goal? This comes from Indeed. Uh, this is your SMART template, and you, of course, you can see the acronym: specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-based. So, if you are um, in recruiting or you're getting ready to do a recruitment type um, um, adventure here, then uh, you can follow the SMART goal setting framework. What's your recruitment goal? Do you have a marketing team? Um, if you have three or four people, it's, uh, we've got two here, uh, actually three that myself, and then, um, I have Jonna who, who will help out with that. I'll let her drive the train on that as I'm training her. And then we've got, uh, of course, Rick, who's our HR director. We run everything by as well. Uh, then, you know, measurable again, back to KPIs. If your KPI, uh, might be to speed up your hiring price from 30 days to 14 days, you know, what's that going to cost there? Make sure you've got the resources you need to accomplish this goal. Is it aligned with your business objectives? Is it realistic? I mean, we're all facing challenges today. There's no doubt about it. But is this realistic? And that's where a lot of companies get in trouble. They have this, they have this grand vision, but if they don't have the, the realistic business objective and the way to meet that goal, then you're going to be in trouble. And then when, when, you, when will you accomplish this goal? Uh, so let's go to talk a little bit about retention because this is something I think will, will help us uh, meet some of the challenges that, especially if it's internal, perhaps on how do we keep our employees. So when you look at this, uh, retention needs to be top of mind for any company, uh, whatever challenges you're facing. Now, keep in mind, if you have an employee that is, uh, uh, that is not uh, <laughs> performing well, then you've got your internal disciplinary procedures there. But as the cost of losing top talent is great, um, the SHRM estimates it costs twenty to thirty thousand in recruiting and training expenses to replace a manager that makes forty thousand a year. So you start looking at the math. Now this doesn't even count for losses in terms of interview time, your productivity, cultural impact, low retention rates, impact, motivation, productivity, performance. Now we have seen that. Um, we have dealt with that on an internal basis. If you've got people coming and going, if it's a revolving door. What does that say to your people who are your long-term performers, right? They see that and they're like, man, why is everybody quitting? What's going on? They begin to question. Um, before employees quit, they may become less of a team player, minimum amount of work, fail to commit to long-term deadlines, and you've got production issues. So the key point, you know, the key is to pinpoint the issues that's driving employees to leave and address them before it's too late. You go back to general patent. I mean, you've got to grab the problem by the nose, kick it in the pants, and then you've got to think outside the box. We have got to be aggressive on our hiring if this is what we're going to do. And then we've also got to uh, keep the people that we hire, the good people. Uh, because you see, the stats are, are pretty clear. 77% of the reasons behind employee departures are preventable. Uh, it's one of the things that we do uh, that I do a lot of is the uh, internal uh, complaint issues. So if somebody's got a complaint, uh, the managers know to call me. I'll sit down and do an intervention with with that associate. Find it. You know what? A lot of times it is. There's just 
some problems at home and you want to, you want to challenge, have that associate come in and sit down and tell you, well, it was tough paying my bills because my electric bill from AEP went up uh, from $200 to $700. What do you, you know, what are you going to do with that one then? What are you going to do when you have that associate comes to you and says, my marriage is on the rocks. What are you going to do when they say, well, you know, I was up all night at the ER with my child or my, my, my brother or my daughter, my child uh, overdosed or whatever it may be. So really a lot of people think that, um, you know, they're just supposed to come to work and just ah, shut everything down outside and come in and perform. But really we know that external influences can impact internal performances. And so I'm not saying we can solve everybody's problem. We can't, but what we can do is, is build some building blocks that would help them. And so, so let me get that to the next slide. So you, you build that employee engagement and, and, and employees, they feel valued when they feel like they have a voice. I don't care what company, what organization it is. Uh, it, it, you, you pick any, any organization. I don't care if it's public, private, whatever. If an employee feels like they have a voice that they can go to that supervisor and and yeah, you know, and here's a challenge. Y'all want another challenge? Try this. Um, you have a young employee that comes in, and maybe there's some issues at home, and all this. And the older supervisor's like, "Well, you just need to suck it up and let's get back to work." Okay. Well, mm, easier said than done, right? So, uh, again, recognizing that 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 generational cultural mindset gap. And that's one of the things that, that, that I battle with as well in trying to create a good culture. Um, so, so you build that employee engagement, you know, going on the floor. Hey, you know, John, how's it going today? Joe, how you doing today? You know, Hey, just want to follow up. Look, the other day we chatted, just how's things going at the house? Guys, that means so much to somebody, you know, rather than the old, well, how are you today? I'm fine. And then we drop it and we keep going. Cause how many people lie to you when they're not fine? Come on, anybody can I, can I, yeah, show of hands there. Anyway, so, um, all right. Uh, now, Nate, I told you, don't let me get on my soapbox now. I get going. But anyway, all right, we're having a good time. All right, hang in there. How's everybody doing? We got, uh, oh, we're getting getting a little tight on time. That's cool. And then uh, don't forget dessert. Eat your dessert. All right, let's, uh, you doing good, Nita? How are we doing? Good? We're doing really good. Thank you for all awesome. this information. It's very pertinent for all of all right. us, I feel. Uh, just a couple, just a few more slides, and then then while y'all are, are having your dessert. So, all right. So number two, get recognition and rewards right. So if you build a culture of recognition, and you know, we do an associate of the month recognition, it's uh, they get a monetary amount, special parking spot. I think they like the parking spot better than the money, but uh, you know we do that. We recognize associates of the month. Um, you know, recruiting the right employees, uh, and this is what I talked about a while ago. We have. Um, we're, we're working and we're going to be partnering with uh, some local school systems to do a uh, like a co-op type program spring semester of a senior if they meet the of course going to be 18 to work in manufacturing all that but if we can find just a handful of, of soon-to-be high school grads we're going to bring them in pay them good money train them I mean not every kid coming out of high school is going to go to college some want to jump right out and, and work so so we want to to reach out to those uh, as well. Uh, probationary applicants, that second chance, you know, we're big about thinking outside the box, uh, positive onboarding experience. And here's the thing, folks, if you build that connection early and it's a positive onboarding, you're answering questions. I had, had a, a, a guy come in he came from another manufacturing company and he told me after the first day, he said, I've never seen uh, a, a, he called it a factory. We're not really a factory, but okay. Manufacturing environment. He said, I've never seen uh, as many people that were that actually speak to you. They, they smiled. They were, Hey, how you doing today? He said, I've never seen that any other place I've worked. I, I was like, wow, cool. You know? Um, and, and I mean, it's just, it's what you build. If you build that connection early, that will go a long way in retention and that will then alleviate some of the, the challenges and problems we're facing. Um, promote from within opportunities. We do that. I'm sure you all do that as well. We do quarterly bonuses, you know, offering those winning incentives. We even did uh, last year, we gave away, I just went blank, like 20 sets of tickets to Morgan Wallen with uh, like 200 bucks cash to the, to the winners. And so if you had perfect attendance, 
for a certain time frame, your name went in the bucket. If your name drew out, we gave you the time off. We gave you the cash. We gave you the tickets, tickets for two to go see the, whatever that was last year. Somebody have to help me the Morgan Wallen big concert. Anyway, somewhere down at the racetrack. So, um, you know, we, we, we do that occasionally. It really creates a, a good drive to help our attendance. Um, and really, you've got to have a good relationship between managers and associates. And, and I love this line. Best managers are coaches, not bosses. If you've got somebody that will coach a trainee and help them and be there alongside of them in the successes and the defeats of the job, that goes a long way uh, of really maintaining that retention. What are some of the challenges you have? Remember, we talked about uh, the challenge of, of a generational gap. And all, but if you've got managers that will help coach young people, oh, it doesn't matter the age, but but to, to, to coach younger associates into this environment, that goes a long way. And of course, we do, you know, we promote employee wellness with our on-site clinic here, fitness challenges. You know, hey, we've got softball teams. So, you know, get outside of work and do some things that that's that's really good. So uh, so if we tie that together, uh, tying retention together, uh, and I'm not going to get a lot into this, but we've seen this as well. Uh, only 24% of Generation X employees say that financial stability motivates them to stay in a job. Yeah, 56% of employees say that health care insurance concerns them and benefits that are beneficial matter, money matters. So what's the challenge that your company faces? Uh, do you have people that are, are they talking about money? I mean, what's your competitive salary versus other like jobs? And so this is something that, that we, need to, we need to keep in mind. Um, so hire leaders, not bosses. Uh, you've got to have people in your company. One of the biggest challenges that we, fight, that we face, that I think we face, is just because somebody's been there for 20 years, 30 years, does that make them a good, a good boss? Or does that make them a good manager? I don't know. Uh, you can have very experienced employees who may not be good managers. They may not know how to interact on an authority or supervisory level. So something think about, but have a clear direction towards the future. Every company should have people in the ranks that know where the company is headed. Are you in tune with what upper level management is talking about as far as the direction of the company? Are you getting ready to have a good second quarter or a bad second quarter? How's the first quarter? How did last year numbers compare to the year before? Where are you going? And so that needs to be fluid information from top to bottom because everybody needs to know where we're going. If you're all on the same boat, everybody needs to know why we're going in the same direction. Uh, how do you handle challenges? Um, if you have people in your leadership that are able to handle challenges instead of uh, trying to offload the stress on the employees, that is huge. Again, you, these challenges may be internal for you, that if you've got people who are in supervisory positions that they don't want to handle that employee that comes and says, you know what, you know, I'm having a tough day at home or my home life or whatever it may be. So something to think about there, genuine desire to offer high quality. Folks, I, I, one thing that in my time in, in private business and, and I've run business before is this, if you're going to make a product, uh, it better be the best product you've ever made to go out the door. And that's got to be on a daily basis. Um, uh, Good companies, good leaders. We want our customers to have the best products, the best service, and the best experience. Uh, and we should set that goal. Um, and if you've got a boss that's behind the curve, scrambling to meet the minimums, you're going to have problems. And so a challenge in the labor market today is, is we've got customers. I'm sure as you all do as well. If you've got customers out there that are saying, look, you know, this is not up to speed. I'll go to competition ABC over here, XYZ. Guys, you, you've got to bring the A game and you've got to have that mindset throughout the company. Um, you've got to have leaders that are uh, have a belief in the importance of their people. Good leaders consider employees their most important asset. Uh, and, and that's the big thing. You look at any organization or agency, it doesn't matter what it is, whether, it, again, public, private, whether it's business, whether it's commercial, whether it's fast food, whether it's law enforcement, whatever it is, Okay. People leave managers, not companies. We can be the best company around, but if we've got people who are horrible, nasty, backstabbing managers, then guess what? Are you are people going to work that, that long? No, they're not. Uh, now, I'm not saying, look, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that our managers and supervisors have to walk around with a box of tissues in their pocket for everybody. I'm not saying that. You, you still have to have 
your your discipline. You still have to have leadership. Yes, you got to have all that, but you got to treat people right. Bottom line, you, you got to treat people right. And, and if not, then you see what happens. Good leaders inspire confidence. And that is big. Uh, if you have bosses that are passive aggressive and they've got that frustration, then that's going to really cause questions among your employees. And that could really have a negative effect. Um, you need bosses or and I'm sorry, you need leaders that are honest and leaders that are upfront, but you also have to have leaders that can communicate in such a way that it is not that I'm beating you over the head concept. So um, just a little, little motivational talk there for you. Um, all right. So bottom line is this, when it comes to recruiting attention, it's about one thing is about people. And I think a lot of the issues that we've talked about today that we've seen when it comes to facing the challenges is what can we control? What can you at your company control? You can't, you can't, you can't control the external market out there. You can't control what people are dealing with at home. You can't deal with all the external circumstances, but what you can do is you can care about one thing. And the bottom line is that's your people. And so a lot of these, these challenges that we face, we may not have all the answers, but if we begin where this starts and that's with the people show that you care from the beginning of the process, the people will come show that you care during the process. The people will stay, um, you know, are there outside the box things that you can do that will help your people, whether recruiting, re, uh, retention, whatever it may be. And I think that if we, if we go back to the basics of taking care of the people that will take care of us. Uh, and I think that's what it's about. So uh, I hope this helps a little bit and we've tried to address some issues. Really, I just want to give you just some food for thought and hope this will kind of stir some conversations uh, with you. So there's my uh, phone number, email. If there's anything I can do to help, um, you know, let me know. Chris, so, yes. I've got a couple of questions for you, please, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Go. Um, in being HR at Universal Fibers, could you just tell us what are maybe just a few of the top options new employees are seeking? Well, what we're finding uh, as far as benefits go, you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so when people come in the door, you know, we do talk about, you know, the starting pay, right? So that's, that's obvious. But one of the things that I, I especially in an orientation, I tell them is look from day one for us, we have um, a care team. We have an on-site medical clinic. We also have an app called Alley Health. You put those two together and our associates have immediate access to 24-7 medical care at zero cost. I don't know anybody else around that does that, but we have an on-site clinic that's staffed with a nurse practitioner and a registered nurse. And, um, you know, they can go, it's a prescription. If you need blood work, if you've got a cold, you need a flu shot, COVID test, whatever, we do that on site. And that is a huge cost savings. And so a lot of, a lot of our, our new employees, when they come in, we let them know that they're like, oh, wow, really? And that is important for uh, associates who have families. Mm -hmm. And because when you begin to look at the cost of healthcare today, and, and you see that you have an employer that cares for you and your family to be able to do that, uh, that really speaks volumes. Um, I also really push our, you know, of course, our retirement, you know, our 401k, and, and we try to give them sound, basic um, you know, financial advice about here's why we put money into your retirement for you so, to try to help you get that foundation. Now, it's, we've got a financial advisor that doesn't cost a dime for them to come talk to, so, so they'll, they'll get on site um, all right, get all those. So, um, so really, you. I think sometimes need that that people come in the door. They don't know what they're looking for until we share our benefits with them. And this is the pay. This is the overtime and all of that. But a lot of people come in and say, "Oh, I want to work 60, 70 hours overtime." <laughs> uh, are you sure? Be yeah. careful what you ask for because that is, um, yeah. All right. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, Brandy Peters, really connect HR. I believe we should really connect based on my current work with Bristol Connect Workforce Sustainability Pro, which partners with. Uh, all right, cool. Yes. Um, yes, please. Uh, Brandy, do you see my email on the slide? I think. So if you do, uh, snag it off there and shoot me an email. 
And how do you instill in staff to take pride in their work? Well, we, we are in 18 different end markets. And so one of the things that, that we are constantly doing is we're looking internally to, um, to improve the process to make sure on-time delivery. And a lot of our quarterly bonuses is based on quality and our, our um, on-time delivery, as well as our safety. We push safety big time. And so all of those factors go into the quarterly bonus. So it, it's incentive driven. And you know, when we are in, uh, when we are in the position of meeting the supply and demand for our customers and clients, then that works better for us you know, in the long run from a financial standpoint. So whenever we're sending a product and it ends up in Toyota, Chrysler, Delta Airlines, medical field, military, the NFL, Nike, Under Armour, whenever our stuff is out there and you and the people know that, hey, we are a global company and we are we are in some name brand products around. Like, oh, cool. I said, yeah. So when you watch, you know, NFL on Sundays, you're seeing our fiber in the jerseys. When you're watching basketball and you see the Nike shoes, our fibers in those shoes or so they're like, oh, that's really so it's really the buy in of getting people think that we're bigger than just Bristol. I mean, we're a worldwide company. And and that really gets people charged up about it. Great information. Uh, Can I ask one more question? Yes, I got a couple more here. What we got? Uh, okay. You go right ahead. Uh, let's see. Kathy, can you tell us what are the overtime rules for are for salaried employees? Uh, salary, Kathy, is salary. <laughs> That's, you know, uh, what you get is what you get. I've worked weeks where it's been 40, 50 plus hours and it's still salary. Now, the overtime comes in for our um, our hourly associates. So uh, you know, we do the basic 36, 48, and then it really depends on, on production and what the orders are that we'll have some folks, um, they'll actually sign up for overtime. So that's a huge benefit for those people who want to come in and, yeah, work those extra hours to pick up extra money. Um, so uh, mm -hmm. I think that if that answers your question there. And in, Pamela, isn't there a new, wasn't there a new IRS rule in the past year, maybe year and a half, that there are some salaried employees that still um, are eligible for overtime? They may. I've not seen that. You're, you're probably more on that than I am. Uh, I don't know. Um, if you've got that, send it over to me because I'd like to submit a timesheet for over. <laughs> Kathy, if you can help me out, that'd be great. You know, we'll split it. How about that? Um, and I know that I was doing some reading on the Fair Labor Standard Act the other day for a different project uh, that I'm working on. And it and in looking at that, I know there were uh, certain specifications for exempt and non-exempt employees. It depends on how an organization classifies those. Uh, but as to that, I'm not sure. So if you've got some, Kathy, you know, yeah, shoot it over. I'd like to read that. That may be some good, helpful information. Uh, any keys to success and retention after a year of service? What keeps your team with the company? Pamela. Uh, great question. Uh, we really, Pamela, we make a push to, to say, hey, look, you know, in six months time, if you've been here for six months with good attendance, we're giving you uh, a retention bonus. Not a lot, but hey, it, it, it's still good money. Um, so if they're here for at least six months, then we feel like we've got a, a, a pretty good associate that's got the buy-in to what our goals are, and, and we see good things out of them. Uh, we also look at, at um, yearly raises. So it's, again, incentivizing if they've been here for, for that year, they're going to get another bump up in that pay as well. And, uh, and there's the other, a lot of the other little things we do. We do family fun days, which is a two-day event for all associates. We break out the you know, the water slides and the bungee cord thing and the catered meals and the prizes and all that stuff. So, so we really do a lot of family based events, um, that, that really goes toward that retention. Um, but our, our, our big, I think some of our big keys to success and retention for somebody of that first year or so is really that constant communication, keeping that buy-in, what problems are they facing? Because what I find is in the first 90 days or so, if they're going to hit some bumps, they're going to hit them then. They're not used to working 12 hours. They're not used to being on their feet. Um, the the shifts, whether the night shift, whatever, that could also create some issues. So really we're trying to address those little bumps to get them over because once they hit that six month, they're trained, they're they're certified to run the lines. Uh, they start seeing, you know, the bonuses come in. That really helps it get up through there. So um, 
Oh, what happened to the screen? Where'd Sorry, go? I was trying oh, to uh, get it on. Um... Oh, yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. Thank you. So, Brandy, all right, you've got that. You got the email. Uh, Kathy, Pam. Okay. So, uh, hopefully, that, that answers the questions just a little bit. Um, you know, and, and really, I just wanted to give this to you all as just some good, you know, food for thought, kind of thing outside the box, and, and really just start that conversation with you all that you can take back to your company. And I mean, we're all in, in the same, same business in the, I don't know, same boat going in the same direction, I guess, to try to, um, you know, be a help to, uh, uh to people, uh, in case anyone who can't find Chuck, here's a link to birth five. Yes. So that's awesome. And on that, Leanne, I think too, um, one thing where we've partnered with United way on that is, and that may be, uh, don't y'all also have a link that shows the childcare providers in the region? I think it seemed like I, I saw a link on that that we may have as well. This, oh, this is it. Awesome. You're great. Okay. Good job. So yes, yeah, so that, uh, you guys capture that link and, um, uh, uh, definitely use that for your employees. And we've been so blessed to, to partner with United Way on our pilot project to help offset some childcare costs. So, you know, Universal is really stepping up to, to try to do all that they can. So. Well, Rex, I like to thank you for your time and sharing your expertise with the folks. You know, we couldn't do this program without our existing employers and service providers and and just friends of this program, um, and especially to do it as long as that we had. So, uh, just don't. I want to put in a plug for our next new knowledge session, which will be held on March the fifteenth, and it will focus on federal labs technologies that are waiting to be commercialized. Um, to me, this is a great. Um, session for any business, large or small, that's looking at new products to either manufacture or to sell um, that they might want to look to expand their product uh, and services. So our friend Carl Nobick, who's the regional director of the Small Business Administration of Virginia, will be leading that session. So um, and talking about a smart guy and keeps in tune with everything that's going on. I encourage you to join us on March the 15th. As I mentioned before, this session today is being recorded and it will be posted on the Virginia Highland Small Business Incubators Facebook page and then also on our New Knowledge uh, channel on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and go to New Knowledge and you will find over two, nearly 200 workshops that we've done over the past. Um, I guess we started streaming and recording these in 2015. It's hard to believe we've been doing this and having so much fun, but there's a variety of, of topics on there that you can if you can't sleep at 2 a.m., get you a piece of chocolate cake and a and glass of milk and sit down there and, and learn something. Uh, we had a great session last week on Canva 101. And um, for those that are doing desktop publishing and so forth or creating content uh, like slides, that was a great session. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, Kathy, Nita, do you all have anything else to say, um, partners? I look forward. Hope you'll come back on the 15th. And uh Rex, if you want to share your slides, I'll be happy to uh, to send those to the folks that joined us today. And again, it will be available. And if you like the video and the content, uh, share it with somebody that uh, can take advantage of it. So have a great Perfect. day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.